my name is Mark Grodman. Um, I am CEO of Bioreference Laboratories. Um, we're very proud to sponsor this evening's talk by Jeff Ross. Um, I don't know how many of you who are here know about Bioreference, know about GenPath. Um, Bioreference as an entity is one of the largest clinical laboratories in the country. But we do things that are a little bit different. I'm a physician. I've been affiliated with Columbia for the last 25 years and started Bioreference well over 20 years ago. At that time, we've grown to this year we'll approach $400 million in business. But more than that, have realized that clinical laboratories have a value by being able to go in and work with specialist physicians. And even though what we do is, in some areas of the country in the Northeast, maybe by doing you know, routine services, what we've done in certain clinical areas are rather specialized. We have a laboratory called GeneDx, which is the only clinical laboratory in the country that does three modalities of genetic testing and is the resource in the world for the diagnosis of rare diseases. We do constitutional arrays using array technology and are the only clinical laboratory in the country that uses next-gen sequencing for cardiac diagnoses, for long QT, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or dilated cardiomyopathies. We do more work in uh, correctional health than any laboratory in the country. We have a program using multiplex PCR, looking to be able to do panels and working in sexually transmitted infections for in women's health, which also is from all over the country. And we are most proud about the work that we've done with GenPath. GenPath is our laboratory. It is a pathology laboratory that really specializes in oncology, hematopathology, leukemia, lymphomas, and now in more progressive areas in solid tumors. We have a passion for what we do. This is not corporate. Tests are not designed by in boardrooms as to how one makes money or where, where the interest is. It's designed by what presents and gives clinical relevance. Um, we will be, within a few weeks, the only clinical laboratory in the country that will do microarrays in conjunction with classical cytogenetics and the diagnosis of leukemias. Because, in fact, if a physician is going to use this to be able to understand leukemias, he's going to have to go put all the information together and we're going to do it for him, together, not isolated. In the area of clinical laboratories, look, I'm an internist. I trained at Columbia Sinai Mass General. I happened upon this in a circuitous route. But in coming to clinical laboratories, what I realized that these are wonderful, these are wonderful creations. Because what we have in the clinical laboratory is the ability to take questions of clinical relevance and bring them into need to bring them into the physician's office and talk about them. That's what's special about labs if it's done right. And given the fact that we've had a track record of growth that's been unsurpassed, I think that we've done it right. Um, we're very proud to go introduce Jeff Ross tonight. Jeff Ross also, I, I have feel some of a kindred spirit because he's had and lived in two worlds. Because on one hand, although he is a, he's a professor of pathology and has run pathology at Albany Medical College, trained in Mass General in pathology, Jeff has also done a great deal of work and had one foot into the business world where he's worked in developing new ideas and assays, taking tests and concepts and bringing them to life. His work with Encore, doing fish probes before anyone else, is legendary. With Millennium, he brought new work to bear. He's written review articles that don't only look at things from a scientific point of view, but also to be able to organize data in an important way. His review that he did on looking on predictive tests, comparing Oncotype DX and Mammaprint and other tests like that, is a legendary report that really organized it for a whole range of people, both inside and outside the medical community. As we move into time, there is so much more ideas out there than what technology allows. And where Jeff Ross has done an extraordinary job is to try to take and synthesize the opportunities, what technology can bring us, and what's out there and what is possible and kind of merge them. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with him and get to know him. And his perspective on how this treats, on how we use these decisions and these tools, if you will, to be able to go in and how best to stratify and predict response to solid tumors is something that we've enjoyed very much and coincides with our need and our drive and our passion to find areas of clinical relevance that we can make useful to the physician. So with that, I just want to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Ross.
Thanks, Mark. I'm absolutely de delighted to be here, and I want to thank uh, uh, Jen Path for inviting me to give, give the presentation. Uh, hope you'll both uh, enjoy dinner, as well as some of the comments I'll make, and it'd be wonderful if it were interactive. Um, I'm really looking forward to comments, and this is a uh, evolving story, the uh, personalized medicine for the treatment of the uh, cancer patient, particularly in the area of solid tumors now, and it changes literally on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, um, and it's a great time to be a pathologist. I know for many years my practice in making diagnosis was fulfilling, but when this whole story broke in the early, uh, really 1960s, 70s with the first introduction of the ER and PR test, and then after a bit of a, a long uh, hiatus, then really blossomed with the uh, first use of the targeted therapy towards HER2, a chance for pathologists to be at the bedside making decisions beyond the primary diagnosis that have such an impact on how patients will be treated and classified, and the patients themselves discovering the pathologist's role in new ways, knowing that these biomarker tests like HER2 status, um, or BCR ABLE status, or CKIT status, or uh, EGFR mutation status are so important to them in terms of their hoping to get the best possible outcome from the therapy that's going to be selected. I've uh, got a fairly uh, 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 ambitious uh, uh, catalog of uh, things to talk about with you. I'm going to start out with a brief review of the whole story of the advent of personalized medicine in uh, clinical oncology, and then move on to there to concentrate on breast cancer, uh, an area of my uh, greatest interest. Uh, um, we'll talk about uh, ERPR and HER2 testing, as well as predicting responses to tamoxifen, uh, multi-gene predictors like Mamaprint and Oncotype DX and others. Talk a little bit about where do we stand with topoisomerase 2 alpha testing, and then uh, complete this with a uh, where is the circulating tumor cell assay today, and where might it be tomorrow? Then we'll move on to uh, colorectal cancer and talk particularly about the predictor of responses to the two anti-EGFR antibody therapeutics, the uh, uh, cetuximab and the uh, uh, tocitumumab, and to try to decide whether or not we are finished with just KRAS mutation testing today as a predictor of eligibility and whether we have markers now that are going to go after the KRAS wild type patients and further classify them as ineligible for likely benefit benefit from the targeted therapy to EGFR. <clears throat> then we actually will have a little bit of comments about 5-FU predictors and whether or not we've made any strides forward on that after the last 10 years, and finish up with uh, the two major arms, the full Fox, full Fury, looking both at the oxaliplatinum-based regimens and the irinotecan-based regimens in terms of whether we could predict what's a better treatment to give to an individual patient. And then on to non-small cell lung cancer, where we'll have several things to talk about. Now the anti-EGFR therapy will focus on the re receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor on the small molecule side, which has the indication as opposed to the uh, antibody therapeutic. Is IHC possibly useful? Is FISH better than EGFR mutation testing? Are they all complementary? Should we do them all on every new case? Then we'll talk a little bit again about platinin and GEMSAR, uh, gemzidabine response predictors. Do we have anything that's ready? Is it all just uh, uh, early? And and not yet clinically uh, relevant, we should talk about that. And then finish up with the impact of pathologist role again. <clears throat> After many years of being told, all I need to do is tell the oncologist it's a small cell lung cancer or something else, now enter the era where histologic subtyping of lung cancer really makes a difference. We've got to know that it's not a squamous cell carcinoma because bevacizumab is contraindicated in the squamous cell subtype. Can we always do that with H and E biopsies? Uh, maybe we need markers. I'll talk a little bit about some of those. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about imatinib um, in both the CML and in GISTs, and uh, the cell search uh, and other methods for circulating tumor cells is going to be discussed in the breast cancer, and we'll finish.